I'll make a short introduction. I did not bring his CV up here, which is challenging to me. So uh, I am happy to introduce Nathaniel Daw, who's the Huo Professor of um, Computational Theoretical Neuroscience at Princeton University. That's as of this year. He's a named professor. I think he was promoted professor at Princeton in 2015. I've known Nathaniel uh, literally his whole career in neuroscience. Um, he, uh, he graduated from Columbia, I believe, in 96 in the philosophy of science, so shares that degree with Brooks um, in the same year, right? Where's Brooks? Same year, right? 96. So here's two philosophy of science grads in 96, Harvard and Princeton, uh, Harvard and Columbia, sorry, who are now doing cool things in neuroscience, which are a little bit hard to define in terms of the field they're in. They're in a fusion of uh, computational methodologies, computational neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, psychology, I mean, fun stuff. The kind of stuff that I think the students in my lab are attracted to, and certainly the people in the computational psychiatry unit. After that, he went to work with somebody that I find an extremely interesting character at uh, Carnegie Mellon Institution, Carnegie Mellon University, called David Turetsky, who I've not re-upped on in, in, in a number of years, but um, look him up. He's an interesting guy all the way around. And Nathaniel wrote at CMU um, what I consider to be, in our field, one of the breakthrough theses. Uh, there are two that I can put at the top. The first one was uh, by a guy called Christopher Watkins in 1989. He was a grad student at Cambridge. And what Christopher Watkins did was he fused um, an area called dynamic programming, which with something at the time that was called the method of temporal differences invented by Rich Sutton, and said, really, this is an incremental way to do an interesting thing in animal behavior. What do you think about that? And that caught, um, I think, Peter Diane's attention certainly, and, um, and he handed that to me, and, and he and I worked on looking for biological substrates of what was obviously a really good idea of Watkins, and I think it waited until Nathaniel's thesis, um, which came after that point, I guess he's, um, he's a few years younger than me, um, uh, where he took on board really going over, canvassing the whole field and asking where does this, these computational methods uh, bring us and what kind of new insights can we get and uh, he wrote a thesis. I can't remember the year 2003 Okay, uh, you can find it online. It's chock full of stuff that he has developed and even stuff that he hasn't developed which is kind of interesting it, that's um, It's kind of an earmark of um, Excellent work like that. So it's no wonder then he, w he went off after that and did a postdoc uh, with Peter Diane at um, University College London um, on reinforcement learning models of all sorts of things, um, and then moved to New York University and now is at um, Princeton. Um, uh, his success is uh, no surprise to me, and I'm just happy we could convince him to come to Virginia to talk to us, and so um, during the day, I hope you guys will infect him with your infectious enthusiasm as he peruses through the place. So welcome to Virginia. Uh, thanks so much uh, for the kind and generous introduction. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, it, it, what we didn't quite say is that um, it's sort of a shoulders of giants kind of thing, that really I think I'm the sort of first generation of scientists who sort of grown up entirely uh, after his uh, seminal work on the dopamine system, and it's really that that is the basis of my thesis and everything else I've done. Uh, and so it's great to see him again and to have worked with him over the years and to see all of you, uh, many of you I've known for a long time. Uh, and some of you I haven't. Okay, um, so what I thought I'd do today, let's see if I can advance the slides, um, is um, to sort of give a talk with sort of two or three parts. So uh, I've used for a long time uh, in the problems of sort of reinforcement learning, decision making, how the brain solves sort of difficult decision making problems. Um, and in particular, the idea that there might be multiple strategies or ways of sort of estimating uh, the future value of actions, and that might uh, give us a way of thinking about things like automaticity uh, and habits, but also in the case of sort of psychiatry or, or misbehavior, uh, things like compulsion. And so what I do today is tell you a little bit about sort of the basic story that we've developed over the years about this, sort of the basic science of it, then talk about a little bit of application psychiatry, and then at the end, hopefully we have time, 
uh, sort of new modeling ideas are sort of half, half developed, maybe even half baked, um, that going beyond this and is thinking deeper. Um, okay, so the class of tasks that, that a guy really picked up from Reed uh, and Peter's work uh, back in the day um, that, that I'm interested in and that, that computer scientists are interested in that, that I think is important in biology and for the brain is sequential decision tasks. So what, what makes, one of the things that makes uh, real decision tasks, real decisions in the real world hard compared to ones we often use in the laboratory is that you take lots of actions in sequence, so there's a video game, right? And you, the rewards you get, the points you earn and stuff don't just depend on what you do immediately, they depend on the whole series of actions you take. And more particularly, two things are true. The value of what you do now doesn't just depend on what you do now, it's inseparably sort of coupled from what you do later. So jumping to the right is good because you can shimmy down this thing and jump over the skull and get the diamonds or whatever and earn points. <clears throat> but if you didn't do those things, if you instead jumped to the right and then fell in the fire, jumping to the right wouldn't be any good for you. The other thing is, for the same reason, the consequences of your actions in terms of rewards or punishments are separated in space and time, right? Um, through many steps, potentially. And so that makes it hard to learn what to do or decide what to do, or even figure out how the task works in a kind of trial and error setting. So that's the sort of problem that the brain faces and the problem we've thought about a lot. This is also true in sort of simpler tasks in the lab that we've used to study this kind of thing where people have to make, or animals have to make multiple choices in a row. Um, maybe only two sets, but at least it, trying to preserve this idea that there's a multiple, uh, the, the, the dependency between multiple choices along the way to a reward. Um, so computer science, um, these are this class of tasks is often modeled using what's called Markov decision processes. Um, and the, again, the, it captures this idea that the consequences of actions are delayed and contingent. Um, and so a computer scientist would sort of approach this problem, and this is actually from Chris Watkins' thesis that Reed mentioned, um, by defining an objective function. I'm trying to, as the agent, as the rat in the maze, or the guy playing the video game, I want to uh, maximize the Q as the expected future value in terms of the sum of future rewards that I'm going to take, get for taking some action A, like jumping left or right in some state S, like where I am on the screen right now. But that's not just the reward now. It's also that plus the reward later, plus the reward later, and so on in the long sum. Um, and it's actually sort of a nested branching set of uh, sum over sort of the future uh, possible paths through the world, right? So this is a difficult problem, again, because of the separation between the action here and what I care about down the line, which is a bunch of steps. Okay, um, so in computer science, there's two sort of major uh, models, sort of, strategies for approaching this problem. Um, and, and the simplest one, or the most sort of obvious one, is called model-based learning, and it goes back to early chess computers and so on. Um, and the idea is, if, um, if I could just learn the sort of local consequences of actions, if I could learn that, um, say, th this probability distribution is like if I go left, or if I take action A from the triangle, I get to the square, and if I take action C, I get to the circle. Um, if I learn the sort of local map of the maze, which I could do by sort of heavy and learning, and if I learn the local rewards, like that here I get $10 and here I get $25, then I could literally just compute this long sum, at least in principle, just by sort of iteratively branching through all the steps and figuring out what happens if I do A, then C, and what happens if I do A and D, and so on, and just adding up rewards. So that's actually how chess computers work, right? Um, at least partly. Um, and in the brain, um, we think, uh, you know, we, we think animals do something like this. There's behavior indicating that they do, or even rats and also people. Um, and one sort of little bit of a handle we have for how this might work in the brain is these phenomena of pre-play uh, in hippocampus. So, so you might know sort of famously place cells in rodent hippocampus uh, seem to fire, are tuned for where the animal thinks he is. So the animal runs around and cells fire representing his location. It's also the case that sometimes when animals stand still, these very rapid events, and this is a sort of cartoon of a re actually an actual reconstruction of one of them, there's a rat standing still, it's about 100 milliseconds from David Foster's lab. There's a blitz of spikes from play cells representing a path in front of the animal. Um, the green thing is where the reward is actually, and the animal's about to run there. So it's as though the animal is sort of considering, thinking about a future set of rewards, kind of mental simulation. Uh, as though that could be a sort of substrate for computing this kind of uh, model search. There's also times where animals think about places like where end in a shock and then don't go there. So you can think of it like a valuation, right? It's not just thinking about where he's going to go. It's considering different routes and thinking about what, whether it's worth doing. Okay, so that's model-based learning. Um, now, Reed actually is famous for bringing the other kind of uh, 
learning to neuroscience, which is called model-free learning. And the idea is um, learning all those individual steps, although it's sort of straightforward at learning time, makes choice really hard because you've got to add up all these things and do all that mental simulation. But um, if you could just sort of directly learn and store the long-run value of an action, which it turns out you can do by these temporal difference methods, um, uh, uh, then that gives you another way of, of representing the same quantity and of, of estimating it's a trial and error from behavior. Um, and that's another way that you could just approach the same problem in the brain. And of course, uh, famously, uh, through the, mainly the insights of Reed uh, and working with Peter, um, Diane, it's, this is the sort of predominant account of, of the dopamine system in the primate brain and, and also the human brain. Um, and again, the idea is to sort of take a shortcut, sort of work directly in the space of long-run predictions of action value rather than the sort of maps of, of short-term prediction of action value. Um, now, we think that both of these things take place in the brain, and, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, but there's a lot of work suggesting uh, the, the distinct neural substrates and animals kind of switch off between this more deliberative or model-based mode and this more automatic or model-free habitual mode uh, in different circumstances. Um, and so we've long been interested in sort of asking the question, how does the brain then solve this sort of meta problem of deciding when to be sort of model free, when to deliberate, and when to be, sorry, when to be model based, when to deliberate, or, or when to be model free, and just sort of act according to the previously learned key values. Um, and it's possible to kind of write, once you sort of are careful enough to, to think about what these two strategies mean computationally in terms of ways of, different ways of estimating the long run future value of, of your actions so as to choose the best, the highest valued action from experience, you can sort of ask when, when is each of these, under what circumstances would each of these be more uh, worthwhile? Um, and there's sort of a speed accuracy trade off, right? So um, thinking, deliberation, the sort of model based way is a great way to sort of squeeze the most accurate evaluations you can out of a limited amount of data, but it takes time. Uh, and if, you've, if you're well practiced, you're better off just uh, behaving probably because it's, it's not, you're going to get a similar answer than just thinking it through, um, but faster. Um, and that kind of thinking explains a lot of uh, data uh, about when, say, rodents uh, behave more habitually versus seem to deliberate more. Um, and one reason uh, people have been interested in this sort of class of models and this sort of way of thinking um, is that it gives at least a sort of very seductive way of thinking about all kinds of phenomena where you might be of sort of two minds about things, right? So these kind of two system models have been applied to moral dilemmas and racism and you know, sort of all kinds of sort of conflicting situations. Um, and maybe most interesting for, uh, from our perspective is they're sort of one of the major views of psychiatric disorders involving compulsion. So on this story, you know, why do drugs of abuse have this compulsive character, or OCD or something, um, it's supposed to be because of some imbalance between these two systems, right? The, the, the drugs of abuse train up these, these bad habits and those somehow dominate, even though the person knows through sort of deliberation that he, it's not the right uh, thing to do. Um, so that's a sort of classic account. Everett and Robbins have pushed this as sort of a basic science uh, story of drugs of abuse and compulsion. Uh, there's not a lot of evidence for it and I'll come, come back to that in sort of the second half of the talk. Okay, so that's some background. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how we've tried to study these type of processes in, in humans. Um, uh, and, and what we've done, as I mentioned, is a number of studies uh, using tasks in which people make multiple choices, uh, often two uh, in series, and we study how their choices change uh, in response to rewards, so they sort of how they sort of learn in this setting. So uh, here's one version of, of a task we've used a lot. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. Um, the first uh, stage of each trial, subjects choose between two. These are Tibetan characters. Uh, depending which one they choose, they get another choice. So if I choose this left one, I get this pink choices. Uh, if I'd chosen the right one, I get these blue choices in a second step. Um, and those second choices are sort of a regular bandit task. Those are the choices for money. So, uh, so this one's rewarded 57% of the time, and this one's rewarded 28% of the time. Um, and so the goal of the subjects is to sort of learn. These are sort of constantly changing to keep people on their toes. They're sort of trying to adjust their top and bottom level choices by trial and error to keep find winning the most rewards, right? Um, this version of the task, um, uh, the way it works is actually two different starting states here. Sometimes you start in green, sometimes you start in orange. 
Um, and each of these orange starting uh, actions has a sort of cousin in the green ones and vice versa, so that one of them takes you to pink and one of them takes you to blue. Um, so the reason we do this um, is that this lets us differentiate um, the sort of model-based uh, approach to valuation, which basically um, grounds the value of, say, these green and orange actions in the pink boxes. I think ahead and I think, you know, working out that Bellman equation, what's the value of choosing this? Well, it's the chance that I get here plus the chance that I choose this and get this reward. And similarly for the orange one, um, from the model free ones that basically ground the value of the actions in direct experience. Um, it's, it's slightly more complicated than that for the aficionados, but you can think of it as a, what's called a TD1 algorithm. That basically I learn the value of the green by what actions I get, for, what rewards I get every time I choose green in the past. Um, and so tr these two valuation strategies actually differ trial by trial in how, although they're sort of heading in the same place, they differ in how they construct action values uh, from experience because only the model-based algorithm sort of pays attention to the second level uh, states. Only, the, only in the case of the, the model-based algorithm does value sort of generalize from green to orange via the pink boxes, right? So let me say that slightly more carefully. Imagine on some trial I choose this one and, got, and then this one and got rewarded for it. On the next trial I say I'll give you orange. Um, now, if I were model-based, what I'd learned in the previous trial was that this pink box is, get, leads to a, a coin, so it's more valuable than it might have, I might have thought before uh, at the margin. Um, if, the, if I'm using a sort of model-based evaluation to, to, um, to evaluate this, then I think from here to here, and, I, and, and, I've, and that previous trial affects my choice and increases my chance of choosing this one. If I'm model-free, I don't. Right? So if I'm model free, then all I know about is the history of things that have come after I chose orange other times, and there should be no such generalization. Um, so we can, that's a way of describing something we can look for in data. So um, these are sort of uh, simulations of, uh, of a way of looking at the data that, that from in, in model based and model free models uh, that, makes, that repeats that point. So a model free model. What we're plotting here is the chance that I make the same choice on trial t plus one as I made on trial t as a function of whether I got rewarded or not, um, and also as a function of whether I move from green to orange, that's different, or stay with green, that's same, or vice versa. Um, and so the idea is, if I choose green and get rewarded and choose green again, uh, I'm likely to make the same choice again if I'm rewarded more so than not, right? So there's, I'm learning to repeat rewarded actions at a Wednesday lose shift, that's, that's normal. That's true whether I'm model-based or model-free. The difference is, if I'm model-free, then rewards I get for green don't at all affect my choice of staying for orange, and rewards I get, uh, whereas um, if I'm model-based, then they perfectly generalize from one side to the other. So that's a sort of plot we can make from data. Um, we've done this lots of times, uh, and our expectation and the way things are sort of tuned is that both of these things are sort of happening in the brain, and we're trying to put people in a regime where, where we can see both of them so we can image and so on and look at the neural subjects of this, but so here's an individual subject. Um, uh, this is somebody who's sort of perfectly model free, right? So they have nice Wednesday loose shift behavior uh, as long as you stay in the green boxes, but it doesn't carry over to the orange boxes or vice versa, right? Um, on the other hand, we have people who are sort of perfectly model based. To whatever extent they do Wednesday loose shift for the green boxes, they carry the same amount over to the orange boxes. And then we have people who are at least in the average over a couple hundred trials are somewhere in between, right? So this is someone who has a strong model free component, maybe half of which generalizes over um, if you change the state, right? So you could, you could view that uh, it, either in the average across trials or potentially within trials, it's hard to tell that apart, um, as a sort of superposition of this pattern and this pattern, that they're doing a certain amount of this and a certain amount of this, and you add them up and you get, you, you get some generalization. Right. And of course, if you average over subjects, um, this is a whole data set now, um, that's what you see. Um, you see uh, sort of strong model free learning, about half of which in the average over subjects now generalizes uh, to the other uh, across start states. Um, <clears throat> and so that rejects both of these simple models um, and supports 
the idea that there, there's sort of some combination of both these influences going on uh, in the brain. Okay, so that's the task. Um, uh, when we can sort of simplify visually in the data, I'm sorry for, about the colors, I don't know what I was thinking, but um, we, we can, um, we can uh, plot, take these sort of four bars and reduce them with a regression to two bars, right? We can fit a full computational model also, but, but one way to do this is, is this is the, sort of the effect size of the model-free part and the effects of the model-based part, um, and they're, in this case, they're about the same. It's about 50-50. Um, this is a different way of visualizing the, the result. Um, we've also used a slight variation on this uh, a lot, which has a single start state and decouples the consequences of his reward history from uh, second level history with stochastic uh, transitions instead of having two start states, but the, the logic's very similar. Um, okay, so uh, just very quickly, I wanna say a few things about sort of what we know from this task. We, a lot of people have, at this point, have used this task over the years. Um, one thing is that early on we thought, you know, is it really true that this, uh, that there, there are sort of two discrete things going on here? Um, and one thing uh, my then postdoc Rosado wanted to do was sort of draw on uh, insights from human cognitive neuroscience or cognitive psychology in these type of dual system models. Um, one of the ways they tend to distinguish uh, differentiate more deliberative processes from more automatic ones is through dual task interference, right? So the, the, the prediction was um, if this model-based deliberation strategy is really a distinct thing, um, perhaps you can sort of selectively interfere with it by, you know, loading the subject's working memory if working memory is also required for thinking through states and figuring out what to do, right? Um, and so uh, there's a, this is a within subject data. So the way this worked is that uh, these are now subjects in Texas. Um, on a third of trials, so two thirds of trials sort of look like this. They're just like the, the same task as before, uh, and we get the same result as before. It's a nice mixture of model based and model free. But on uh, one third of trials, the subject had to remember a letter and a number at the beginning of the trial and, and answer a question about it at the end. So they had a sort of working memory load. And within subject on those trials, um, you see a sort of selective interference with the model based strategy, the one that's supposed to be more deliberative, um, whereas the model free strategy is, if anything, you know, fine. Um, we can also do other things. So for instance, uh, these sort of rational models of when it's worth deliberating suggest that if the, if the rewards are changing faster, if the world is more volatile and you're more uncertain, then it behooves you to, uh, to, do, to spend more time thinking you should be more model-based and we can, so we can speed up the change of reward and see that people get more model-based uh, in those blocks compared to reward situations where the rewards are changing more slowly. Um, lots of people have done lots of things, we and others, with, with this task showing sort of between subject and, and within condition differences as a function of aging and IQ and development. Um, I'm gonna talk about psychopathology. Um, and also relating it to stuff in the brain, mainly related to, to prefrontal cortex and dopamine, um, genetics and Parkinson's disease and so on. And so this is you know, a, a reasonable success. One thing to say is that here in almost everything, the effects almost always live on the sort of model-based, uh, on people showing more or less of this model-based behavior, this, this generalization, this smart generalization across states. We don't ever really move the green bar, uh, the, the supposed model-free behavior uh, significantly. Whether well, that's the, something about the brain or something about the task, I'm not sure. Um, but it, what we reliably see is that we can move around the extent to which people rely on model-based uh, behavior. We talk more about why that is. Okay, let me show you uh, one brain imaging study to sort of also get at the question of whether there's really two things going on here. Um, so uh, we could do the same thing, uh, but we could replace the Tibetan characters with categories of visual images that are known to uh, be related to activity in particular parts of higher order visual cortex, right? So famously, there's areas sensitive to faces and houses or places, also body parts and tools. Um, and so we can look uh, in particular, and these, uh, importantly, these areas are actually active not just when you're looking at pictures of faces and houses, but also when you're even thinking about them. Um, and so we can look at when people are sitting here making a choice at the top level um, and ask, is it really the case that they're thinking about the bottom level states, the, I think they were the pink and blue ones before, right? Um, uh, and we could ask, to what extent can we decode activity related to body parts versus scenes? 
Um, and more particularly, to what extent does that track, either across trials or across subjects, the extent to which you're doing this kind of generalization behavior where the rewards you get then carry over to the tool. So our interpretation, of course, is not the only way you could do it, is that the reason those rewards sort of carry over is because they're thinking ahead, and that thinking ahead, uh, then we should be able to see in brain imaging. And so there should be a sort of, a, a sort of uh, match between the brain and the behavior in that case. Um, and that's what we saw. Um, so this is just sort of the visual localizer, a separate task. We find areas that respond to body parts and scenes. Um, and then it turns out every dot here is a subject. Um, you know, up here, one of the subjects I showed you before is completely model-based, and down here is one of the subjects I showed you before is completely model-free. Um, and x-axis is the, the spread between model-based and model-free choice behavior. Um, y-axis is the extent to which we can decode these, these respective future thinking um, about the future states, and it indeed is the case that the more people uh, generalize value across states, the more they're thinking about uh, body parts or scenes, or the more, particularly the more we can decode the scene or body part, whichever state they're going to end up going to once they choose it. Um, okay, so that seems like it supports the idea that there really is this kind of mental simulation going on, and it's connected to the choice behavior. Um, with the caveat that maybe you just have this sort of a single dissociation, right? So maybe some people are just asleep or bored or, you know, have their glasses off or something, and they're just bad at the behavior and their neural signal is also worse, right? Um, so one way of looking at that is we could ask, we could look for a signature, an affirmative signature of the people on this side of the behavior, right? And one candidate for that is this bold activity that was first reported by Reed um, in the striatum, which uh, in the ventral stratum, you can reliably see bold activity related to reward prediction errors, uh, much like the dopamine neurons that are input there. Um, that's been seen again and again. That's not itself interesting, but we can ask how strong is that activity um, related to behavior, and that goes the other way, right? So the prediction is, the, the idea is people who are relying more on, on model-free learning um, have stronger uh, model free prediction errors in the striatum, so we have a sort of affirmative signature of them. They're not just asleep, uh, and it's like a sort of double dissociation. We see neural activity related to the, what are supposed to be these two strategies, um, and those two neural strategies seem closely related to the match up with the behavior, uh, the way we interpret it. So it seems like it sort of all works out, um, which puts us in a position to get to the other set of questions I want to ask today, which is the sort of psychiatric questions. Um, so again, People have been going around saying maybe disorders of compulsion uh, have something to do with imbalance between these two supposed systems in the brain, and how would we test that? Um, so early on, my collaborator, Valerie Voon, um, did a study where she, she thought she could try to test this very kind of broad brush by gathering up lots of different patient groups with compulsion problems, the idea being that maybe this is a sort of transdiagnostic uh, signature. Uh, so she worked with a bunch of collaborators. Um, there's like 20 people on this paper. Some, some of you may be on this paper. I don't know. Um, the, uh, with groups of patients with different disorders. So this is a composite of all the healthy uh, mat match controls for the three groups I'm going to show you. Um, they all look kind of the same as the, as the controls before. Um, but three patient groups, uh, binge eating disorder, which is a compulsive uh, DSM eating disorder, uh, meth or cocaine abusers, and OCD patients. This, this last one has been replicated a bunch of times in different ways, by the way. Um, all, of, all of them uh, are selectively and significantly worse in model-based learning and okay in model-free. So there does seem to be some kind of imbalance, and the way we're picking it up here is that all these groups who are compulsive patients, one way or another, seem to be selectively bad at model-based learning on this task. Um, and so we were all kind of excited about this, I think, because um, it seemed like it was sort of connecting this to the real world. Um, but there's a number of interpretational problems, right? Um, there's no patient control group here, right? So these are all a bunch of sick people and a bunch of healthy people, and the sick people are work worse at the task or worse in one particular way. So maybe this is stress or, you know, something much more general, like spending time in a hospital or something. Um, and indeed, Papers started coming out left and right uh, from us and other people showing similar deficits in lots of different disorders that didn't seem like they had a lot to do with compulsion. So schizophrenia, social anxiety. Um, 
So we started to worry maybe there's nothing really specific going on here. Um, and at this point, this amazing postdoc, now Professor Claire Gillen, uh, entered and said, you know what, I think the problem here is not the construct or the, the idea, the hypothesis, the problem is the design of these experiments. And the reason is, is that schizophrenia is not really a thing, social anxiety is not really a thing, you know, 95% of schizophrenia smoke, and the social anxiety paper, they're unable to completely control for substance use disorders and so on. Because of comorbidities and also poorer definition of the illnesses, these case control studies don't really let you test these transdiagnostic ideas. So maybe there's some compulsive dimension that goes across all these groups, for instance. Uh, and so what Claire did was take a sort of completely different approach, um, which is uh, do a huge online study of a general population sample on the internet uh, using Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, this, the second wave of this was about 1,500 people. Uh, and what's shown here, what she did is she gave people first just a whole range of questionnaires on symptoms of different disorders. And they were sort of roughly grouped into compulsive symptoms like eating disorders and OCD and sort of mood disorders as a control like depression and uh, anxiety, um, hoping, to look, to hoping to sort of look for as a transdiagnostic relationship of the compulsive symptoms specifically. This is a correlation matrix of all of symptom by symptom, I think there's 150 separate symptom reports or something, um, across all this data. And what you see is you see this sort of blue on the diagonal, the, of course, the, the, the individual questionnaires that correlate with themselves. Um, but there's also, it's a little harder to see, they also correlate across questionnaires, right? So like the, you can see here, some of the different mood disorder questionnaires correlate with each other. And so this sort of transdiagnostic structure here, and if you do a factor analysis on this data, you sort of pick up the way these questions were picked up, were designed, which is that there's a factor, there's a co-variation across people in a cluster of symptoms related to mood disorders, uh, also picks up some things in an impulsivity questionnaire, um, there's another one which is really about social anxiety. So it turns out the people who are tested, who do online tests for a living, have just ridiculous levels of social anxiety. Um, this is sort of an opportunity and also a strange thing, but it's, it is nevertheless the case. So that gets its own factor. Um, and then there's another one that basically picks up compulsive symptoms across diagnoses. And so binge eating, impulse buying, uh, and so on. Interestingly, it also picks up not just compulsive behaviors, like I mentioned, but also sort of intrusive thoughts. Um, which sometimes come up in schizotypy or in uh, some of the mood disorder questionnaires, disturbing thoughts, inability to control thoughts. These seem like they, they cluster across people uh, with the compulsive behaviors. And that's an interesting sort of finding on its own. So this is a completely unsupervised analysis, but now we can go back to task behavior. These people also did the two-step task. Um, and what we find now is a very specific relationship between factor two, which is the compulsive one. The more of these symptoms you report, um, the worse you are at goal-directed behavior. Um, and this is significantly different. There's no effect of, um, of the mood disorder factor. Um, and there's, depending on how you do it, a positive effect that people who are more socially anxious are actually a little better at the goal-directed, uh, at the model-based decision-making. So, so now we see a result that's both transdiagnostic but also selective. So this sort of starts to provide this sort of the control that we had sort of sought. Um, okay, so we were excited about this for a couple of reasons now, both for the results and also because the method seems like it could be powerful and people have indeed started using this for other things. Claire did one more thing with this method, which I think is even cooler, which is she went back um, and... Oh, I mean, these are literally, I mean, we can go back to the, this is just questionnaire, so it's like, how often, you know, how strongly do you have this symptom? I find myself unable to control thoughts, you know, one to five. Um, uh, how much of the things, well, no, it's literally, do you have disturbing thoughts? I mean, the, the, I, I mean, I, we could go back to, uh, this is a sort of summary, of, but there's some question, which is, these are just questions on a, on a questionnaire. Do you drink in the morning? How often do you, okay, so that, I mean, and there's clearly, uh, you know, on the one hand, this is how people diagnose these disorders, right? But it's not, it, it's, it's far from a scientific measurement, but it is very regular. Um, but, but yes, I think the question here is literally like, how often do you find yourself disturbed by thoughts? We, we can look up the exact wording, but um, yeah. Okay, um, so what about actual patients? So these are, uh, you know, these are 
general population sample, and the prevalence of this disorder is being what it is, there's plenty of sick people here, right? You know, 10% of these people have clinical levels of depression. Something like half of them have clinical levels of social anxiety, which is unusual. Um, so it's, but, but we don't have clinical diagnoses. Um, and so we wondered if we could take this back into, the, use the sort of same technology, but go back to a more sort of patient kind of setting. And so what Claire did was get patients referred by physicians uh, with a diagnosis uh, into the study, and then they would do the same kind of online testing. Um, and they would also have a sort of clinical phone interview, so we'd get a sort of characterization uh, along with the record we got when they were referred. Um, and I'm not going to uh, dwell on this paper that just came out, but the, the, the basic idea is, in this case, there's no control group. What we have is, uh, it's hard to see, um, two disorders, OCD, which we thought was a compulsive disorder, generally anxiety disorder, which is supposed to be a control, right, because it doesn't, generally anxiety disorder doesn't really have compulsive symptoms and isn't really thought of in these terms, and then people with both diagnoses. Um, and the result is that there's actually no difference by diagnosis in terms of how model-based people are. You can also see that here. Um, the, the, the clinical label doesn't do any good at, at relating to the underlying brain construct that we think is actually you know, important in terms of the basic underlying architecture. But the compulsivity score, which is from a slightly different battery of questionnaires now, but the same idea, um, does, across all these groups, strongly relate to model basis. So there's the, to the extent you have more or less compulsivity, whether you have a, this diagnosis or that diagnosis or both, um, really does relate to the underlying brain mechanisms, that, at least as we think we measure them by the task, but, uh, but the diagnoses are useless in that respect. Um, so I, I think this, again, speaks to the idea that the way to study these things may be through these more graded kind of trans-diagnostic trans dimensional perspectives. Um, uh, and those are the ones that seem like they're being picked up by the sort of neurocognitive tasks. Okay, um, so now <laughs> we're on to the part of the talk that's a little more unfinished and speculative, and I thought since uh, a number of you are my close friends, I'd throw in sort of a bit of the talk that's, that, that this points in future directions. Um, and so what I've told you is a story um, which is kind of a crude story about how the brain works in terms of two systems. I'm sure it's much more complicated than that, right? But you have this sort of deliberation system and an action system. And then you have this story about compulsion as basically acting instead of thinking, right? So you either act or you think. And if you act too much instead of thinking, then you get this, so you're sort of blind to the fact that drugs are bad for you and so on, and then and you behave in ways you shouldn't. So that's, again, I'm, I'm I, I, this is not my idea, right? This is an idea that, that has been pushed by a lot of people, and I think there's something to it. But it's also sort of dumb, right? Or it's sort of crude. Um, it can't be the whole story. And so what I talk to you about is, is three kind of more nuanced ideas as they're coming up more in computational modeling in this area. Um, and uh, of, of sort of additional or, or deeper ways of thinking about uh, some of these problems or of additional psychiatric problems. And the, the common theme, insofar as there is one, is going back to the, the, sort of the title of this talk um, and the thing I said at the beginning, which is that there's this problem in sequential decision tasks, which is connecting actions to outcomes over space and time and over kind of multiple steps of contingency. And that, that so much of the difficulty here that's forcing the brain to do sort of complicated things um, that can go wrong relates to that, right? Um, so let me give you three examples of that, really as a sort of sketch. Um, and two of the three are published, so you can read about them. I'm not going to go in much detail. The first one in a slide um, is the following. I said that chess computers work by, you know, planning through future states and searching and stuff. And that's true, um, but they can't, chess is too big, right? They can't really search through all of them. So a huge amount of the action in actual chess computers, and I'm sure in the brain also, is not just, am I going to think or am I going to act? It's like, which paths do I think about? Which is the most promising line of, of chess moves to think about? Um, and when should I stop thinking and move, right? So there's a sort of more granular selection question, which is really the issue in a lot of these in AI, and should probably be the issue in, in the brain also, which is that you can't think about everything. Um, in fact, I showed you these, uh, these uh, reconstructed trajectories from hippocampus. Those happen one at a time, and the rat's standing still, right? So 
there has to be a sort of prioritization there. It's not a cone or something. The animal's thinking about one thing at a time. Um, and the question is, which ones? So if you view the problem that way, as instead of whether or not to think at all, you can again kind of write down a rational model. And uh, Marcelo Matar did this last year. Um, the idea is you decide sort of which, in a spatial task which trajectories to simulate, let's say, um, by computing some approximation to what is likely to earn you. So we call this the expected value of computation, expected value of backup. The idea is if you think about something that will teach you about the value of action that has some chance of telling you something is going to be better than you thought and helping you make a choice and earn actual rewards. Right? So thinking is valuable because it helps you earn rewards in later decisions. We can quantify that at least approximately and figure out at least sort of the principles by which you should direct your thoughts to things in front of you or things behind you or things in other environments altogether. Um, having done that, um, it turns out that a whole bunch of this data, and I'm not going to go through it, but this is a sort of cartoon that uh, some of these guys drew of it, um, about which trajectories rats think about when, um, other than where they are, like a forward, forward or backwards or, or non-local, these sort of non-local replay events. Um, can be explained, the sort of regularities about when do you see forward replay, when do you see backward replay, you know, which paths do they tend to think about, um, can be understood in terms of this sort of first principles theory of expected values of, of computation. Um, and so I think we have an exciting sort of window, in, in, potentially in the rodent brain, really into this questions of prioritization and uh, mental simulation. Uh, and we're, we have a real opportunity now to sort of do studies that were understood in these terms and actually have animals doing sort of more reinforcement learning type tasks, see if this really works. Um, in the meantime, um, we can explain what we know about this and, and we're sort of waiting to do new experiments. The thing I want to sort of focus on today is that I think this helps us sort of get beyond this sort of simple dichotomy between sort of thinking and acting and compulsion is just acting. Because um, it sort of turns the issue towards a sort of more selection or more sort of positive things. So issues like craving or rumination or hallucination, these are sort of all biases in what you think about, and those might relate to your behavior also, and we have some evidence that they do. Um, uh, uh, but now we have a sort of computational theory of, of, of what the processes are that are sort of supposed to be directing that, and when you start thinking about how they're, uh, how they're affected in disorders. So I think we, we have sort of, we're closer to, to being able to think about this class of symptoms, let's say. Uh, and again, I think it's a, a richer way of thinking about the problem than, than the sort of crude uh, think or don't think kind of way. Here's my second example. Um, and this one's a little bit technical, but, uh, but um, two, three equations uh, is all. Um, this is a version of an equation I showed you before. This is the most important equation in, uh, in reinforcement learning. Uh, it says that the value of what I do now, the expected future value, is the sum of the reward I got plus rewards later. It's written recursively, so this V is this one. You plug it in, you get the sum of rewards I wrote before, right? What I want to point out now is that it's got a max in it, okay? So it says the value of what I do now is, the, is what I get immediately, and then the value of what I do next time, but I got to make a choice there too, and the value of what I do now depends on that choice. So I got to choose the best one, so there's a max there. If I run this out, substitute this for this, there's another max of the next step and another max of the next step. And so what this says is, and this is where the, all the difficulty comes in in reinforcement learning in more detail, figuring out what to do now, what the best thing to do now is can't be solved without also solving what the best thing to do it is at every other place I might end up in the future. Right? All these problems are coupled. All these maxes um, uh, are necessary to figure out because what I do now, you know, whether I get that jewel if I jump left or right, depends on what I do when I jump left or right. And so figuring out the best thing to do depends on figuring out the best thing to do later also. And the fact that all of these optimizations are coupled in this sort of one giant horrible mess is why these algorithms have such a hard time with planning. Why they involve these sort of recursive, iterative, nonlinear search through a bunch of different situations. Um, so here's an amazing fact which was hiding in plain sight, which my postdoc PyM just discovered. In the control theory literature, they take a different approach to a, a set of problems that's sort of like this one, um, but it's like if you have a rocket ship that's in gravity uh, and it's falling through some, uh, some gravitational dynamics and you have to spend energy to fire out of that, the more so, the more you fire out of it. Turns out those problems look almost the same, except they have a penalty term, which is related to sort of how much uh, fuel you fire out, which is related to how far your dynamics under control differ from how far the dynamics would have been in the gravitational field without the control. 
It's almost the same equation, except now it's easy um, to solve. Um, it's, and this shows it's easy. It's a linear, this is like, um, it may not look easy, but it is. This is just a matrix times a vector. This is like a one um, layer of a neural network. Uh, can compute this, and it can compute the optimal answer to this problem. This problem is not quite the same as this problem, but it's close, right? So in particular, if you assume some default dynamics and you charge yourself um, for going away from it, then all of a sudden you get a problem you can solve easily instead of a problem that's hard. Um, and you can think of this, in other words, you could use this as a proxy. Um, if you can, particularly if you can choose a default dynamics that's likely to be a good choice, this will bias you towards tending to follow default dynamics, but it's only a soft bias. It's not, it's not sort of hard, uh, hard errors. Um, and so we suggest that this might be a way to implement this kind of thing in the brain uh, by introducing these sort of expectations about what actions I tend to make in the future, all of a sudden I can solve the problem, at least solve a related problem, sort of systematically related to the one I want, leaving with some interesting biases, but basically doing a good job, a better job than anything we know how to do otherwise. Um, and again, this works ridiculously well. Um, and um, I think I'll actually skip the simulations. Um, but it again, explains a lot of stuff about how people and animals can do planning and replanning across different tasks. Um, also, how things in the brain can represent predictions over multiple steps, like grid cells, which represent locations far away from where you are, um, in a way that respects these, all these maxes, because um, that, of course, changes depending on what you're going to do and what your goals are. Um, uh, and again, so lots to say about this, but the thing I'd like to focus on today is that if we use this as a sort of proxy, um, and we think this is how the brain's actually solving the problem, then we have a much subtler notion of habits or biases or, or misbehaviors than like I hammer a lever for food I don't want or I, I inject drugs that I, that I know are bad for me, right? These are very subtle biases that I'm sort of tugged towards the things that I expect to happen in the future. Why? Because I need to make those assumptions in order to solve the optimization problem that tends to bias my behavior and introduce these sort of like Stroop effects um, or, uh, patterns of, of error rates that differ between conditions and things like that. Um, so I think uh, this also might be a real formalism for thinking about uh, disorders and misbehavior in a much subtler way than we have before. Um, and I think there's one more application of the same idea specifically to overgeneralization and anxiety, but I think I'm running out of time. Okay, so I will, I will, there's three more slides then and then I will wrap up. Um, so this is one more, a more specific application. Uh, and this paper I think was just accepted. Um, the one puzzle uh, with anxiety is, can I, can I just yeah, sure. Can you go back to slide? Yeah. You never said Kubler-Leverage. Sorry, yes, KL means Kubler-Leverage. So that, sorry, the penalty here is a measure between two, between two probability distributions probability distribution under the, under the default dynamics, the probability distribution under the controlled dynamics. And so it charges you for getting farther away, just like you're firing a rocket in gravity, farther away from where the gravity wants to pull you. What would your homolog be to the default, the pi of the... Um, so the first order thing is to have it be random, right? Um, so that, that's just a sort of unbiased regularization on your policy that then becomes easy to solve. But because it tugs you towards that, if, you, if there are regularities in your behavior, you're better off building them in, right? So if you learn that you always do word reading instead of color naming, or, some, or you always you know, take this action in this circumstance and some other action in some other circumstance, if you put that into the default dynamics, that is a better assumption about what you're gonna do in the future. This cost term is gonna be smaller, and so you're gonna be closer to the thing you're actually trying to solve for. Um, that's right, and so that's, that's the point. The point is that this could be experience dependent as well, but it's just a soft bias. And then of course that, that, but that bias could be disordered in some way. You know, it could be thinking about drugs or something and lead to relapse, let's say. Okay, good, that was a, thank you for, um, uh, I've actually never talked about this uh, particular thing before. Um, okay, uh, last idea uh, and then I'll wrap up. Here's a weird thing about anxiety, which actually seems weirder when you think about it in terms of these rational decision-making models or like decision theory. 
Um, and it's the following. So across anxiety disorders, one of the things that you see is sort of generalization of avoidance. You know, people aren't just afraid of social situations, they're afraid of leaving their house or something, or aren't just afraid of spiders, they won't, they won't go anywhere. Um, and, and so you get avoidance behaviors that are spread throughout the environment and, and fear that spreads throughout the world. And, and, and if you think about this from an from a optimal decision-making perspective, it's actually pretty weird. Um, and this example is meant to show you why that's weird and puzzling. And I think it also points to what the problem is uh, in more detail. So there's a difference between approach and avoidance. So if there's a hamburger in my world, if I go over to it and eat it, you know, if I can go from here to, to the back and get pizza and eat that pizza, that now means there's an opportunity that's propagated from there to here. So if I'm now there, I can move to here and then get the pizza. So approach um, propagates opportunity, right? It, it pushes the value of rewards around the world. Avoidance does the opposite, right? So if I could get run over by running into the street and, and being in danger of being hit by cars, I can avoid that by following traffic signals, right? If I follow traffic signals, I don't have to avoid sidewalks, right? I, and so whereas approach propagates reward, avoidance contains punishment. So here's a sort of simple world where there's a, a, a $10 in one place and losing $10 in another, and all we've done is plot the value function, the sum of expected future rewards over space, and what you see is that the whole space is valuable because the hamburger or the $10 is an opportunity from everywhere, and you don't have to worry about accidentally stumbling into the, the loss because you'll avoid it if you're next to it, and everywhere else you don't have to worry, right? So there's a sort of asymmetry in these things, and it comes from the same max we're talking about. So what's really going on here is that when I'm thinking about what's the best thing to do now, I'm also thinking about what's the best thing to do later, and I assume I do the best thing later, and that means I'm going to avoid, okay? Um, so this is common sense in some sense. I mean, it's sort of technical decision theory, but it's embodied in what we mean by making decent choices. There's an asymmetry here. Uh, and it means that generalizing avoidance is a weird thing to do, right? That I don't have to worry about whatever it is I'm worried about as long as I could avoid it later. Um, and I think this also points to, you know, what is the misevaluation that might be going on here. So one simple way to think about that is, as I mentioned before, what's hard about decision making is having to make assumptions about your future choices. If your assumption were not that you make the best choices later, but you're likely to make a mistake later, like you're likely to do the worst thing instead of the better thing, if you believe that you have some kind of lack of self-efficacy or control, which is sort of a, in, in psychiatric jargon a way of talking about misbeliefs cognitively that anxious people have, then you end up with a different value function. You end up with a value function that propagates uh, the worst action instead of the best one. At least we can parameterize that. Um, and maybe that's a way of thinking about what's gone wrong in these disorders. And so if you do the same thing for different levels of propagating danger instead of uh, over the min instead of the max, you can get worlds where you shouldn't actually go anywhere because they're just too dangerous, right? Or, or, or you should at least skirt, stay away from whole areas of the world uh, instead of uh, instead of being free to, to uh, pursue it, any, to, to traverse it anywhere. Um, okay, and so again, there's a lot to say about this. There are many both kind of laboratory and real world aspects of anxiety that I think this kind of thinking sheds light on, and that's what this paper is about. Um, for instance, a lot of laboratory experiments that show that anxious people have difficulties in particular tasks that involve forecasting future events like the uh, the b famous balloon analog risk task where people are less likely to pump up a balloon if they're anxious uh, that can explode and lose the money. Um, this, this kind of thinking captures it. So we think this is sort of a core, um, uh, a, a, a core way of thinking about uh, this disorder and what might be going wrong. And again, I think it's, a, it's another kind of subtler way of looking at the decision theory uh, and, and what's really tough about it for the brain and understanding what might be going wrong in these disorders. Uh, and that's it. So what I have uh, tried to tell you today in the grand theme is that how we compute the sort of decision variables that guide our choices uh, influences what we actually uh, choose. Um, so for instance, I told you a sort of simple story in which we have two strategies for computing decision variables underlying this kind of deliberation versus habitual or automaticity conflict. Um, the strategy of model-based recomputation versus model-free action. Um, 
and these have distinct neural and behavioral signatures, uh, and we think they're related to automaticity and also disorders of compulsion. Um, and as I've said, I think that as we understand these computations in more detail, there's really subtler and more interesting possibilities for thinking about uh, psychiatric disorders, uh, including uh, prioritization about what to think about and things like rumination and craving. Um, and also the fact that, for, that forecasting future value requires forecasting future actions, and that might involve uh, biased default dynamics or sort of some kind of pessimism about your own future uh, efficacy. Um, so um, thank you very much. These are the people who did uh, the work. I mentioned many of them. Um, thank you. So, uh, um, so, the, so, so it, it, let me be a little more precise. It is a Markov decision process still. Pi d is a probability distribution over the successor state. So it's still, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a sort of subset or it's a particular objective function over MDPs. Um, and the assumption is that you pay based on this particular KL term between, you get to choose a probability distribution over successor states and you pay according to how much it differs from the given default dynamics. So that, that might not be actually a good model of gravity in physics, but that's the kind of thing we're talking about, right? You know, in the brain, you might imagine um, that computing over complicated future-looking trajectories under whatever kind of principle is costly energetically. Uh -huh. And you might have built into that, uh, well, I don't want to compute that. That's really, really costly to me. And the expected return structure isn't worth it. That's kind of the way I fit it into what I was thinking. It, 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 to, to explain the way in which energy use, literally in the cortex, is tightly coupled to the computation mm -hmm. that you're doing. Yeah, so I think. That's, that's the thing that first struck me when you. Yeah. So maybe that's, I mean, uh, there actually is another paper using the same equation interpreting it more that way, as you have, as, as, in, in fact, so there's two papers using the same, uh, giving it different spins on this, currently making their way through the world. Um, I actually think that's more the issue here and in the older kind of model-based model-free model -based competition, right? So here, we're actually computing what's, what, what is it worth to me to, you know, to simulate some trajectory or before we're computing what's it worth to me to, to th think through the whole tree, and we're comparing that to some cost, right? Partly the cost of time, but partly the cost of energy, right? Um, here, it's, um, it's just a matrix multiplication anyway. Right, so this is just saying, if I, if I, if I choose to solve this problem instead of this one, or the, this family of problems parameterized by this default distribution, which I now get to choose, then I can solve it easily, you know, every time I make a choice, right? And more particularly, this matrix M, which is where all the action is, which is sort of long-run future predictions about where I'm going to end up as I step through the world making lots of choices, it's reusable from problem to problem, no matter what my goals are, because it depends only on the default policy. So it pulls me to the default policy, and that costs me, but it lets me reuse a bunch of computation and have things like stable grid cells that, that represent long-run predictions over the world. And so I think, I, I think it's a useful way of, yeah, cool. of yeah, right. formalism. Um, yeah. Some yeah. question, then I'm going to because the students are going to get a shot at you at lunch, that's the thing I want to look for. Sure. I, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it should, you, you want it, you want to choose it, you probably want to learn it, right? Um, so that on the one hand, you know, you don't ha it's, it's, it's because it's only a soft bias, you can reuse it. Um, but if you do live in a world where you're always, you know, so Stroop, Stroop effects are a good example. I, I do much more color, word reading than color naming, right? If I build that into my expectations, if I usually do color reading or <laughs> word reading, then I'm, go I'm gonna make fewer mistakes on that, I'm gonna be faster on that, 
Um, and I can, uh, if I learn that the things change, then I can change that. But um, so there's a sort of balance between the fact that you can reuse it, but you might as well make it as faithful as possible to past experience or to circumstances, right? That's the, that's the sort of the game here. And it's sort of the same game as habits and actions in the old story. It's just a sort of softer version of that, right? Um, and I think it's a, it's a sort of richer way of, you know, not just gross habits where I do the wrong thing, but but fine-grained tendencies that if I'm in, you know, if I'm angry, I'm more tend to extent, uh, more likely to take an aggressive action or something, right? That, those are the kinds of things that could go in here, and they just nudge behavior a certain way. So would you say that, like, if you're doing treatment, and um, the making of targets for those Um, maybe. So the, so the question is, is this, I'm not sure this is a complete stand-in for the old idea of habits, like real, you know, uh, rats hammering a lever for food they don't want kind of habits. That may still be, you know, model-based, model-free Q values or something, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not th this may not be everything, but I think this is a, s a potentially important way the brain might have action tendencies that could be learned and could be wrong and could be context specific or emotion specific that we might want to start thinking about. But this is a brand new idea. The paper hopefully will be posted in the next day or so, but it's really new. All right, well, thank you for your again.